Hi, I'm Tyler Alderson, the host of this week's Ask Historians podcast episode. And before we begin, I did want to note that this week's episode is talking about explosions in gunpowder mills, which were very dangerous and unfortunately often ended in tragedy for the men who were working in those mills. And this podcast does feature uh, very graphic and very frank discussions of what went on during and after those explosions and uh, the effects that it had on the men who were working there. Uh, Richard Templeton, the author of the book Across the Creek, does a wonderful job in the book of humanizing uh, the people who worked there. He wanted to uh, make sure that it be known that he did this work to honor those people who died. Um, but we do also get into the actual facts of how they died. And that is important to keep in mind as you go through this podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Yes, hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm Tyler Alderson, your host, and I'm joined today by Richard D. Templeton, the author of a new book called Across the Creek, Black Powder Explosions on the Brandywine. It is about the fascinating history uh, behind the DuPont gunpowder mills. And uh, as you can imagine, with the name uh, Black Powder Explosions, uh, it was, well, it was a very interesting time. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure, Tyler. Now, this is something that uh, I'm sure a lot of people uh, know in terms of the DuPont name. They're one of the largest chemical companies in the world at the moment. But they got their start from a guy who's, whose name was DuPont and his gunpowder mills. How exactly did, did, did DuPont come over to the U.S. and how did this all get started? Well, in 1800, actually in 1799, uh, E.I. DuPont, his name was Eleuther Irene DuPont. They called him E.I., thankfully for all of us, um, or Irene. Uh, he came over with a dozen members of his family on a ship called the American Eagle. Uh, they almost starved to death on their trip over. Um, but they were saved by a couple of meetings with English ships going the other way who provided uh, their whereabouts and also uh, food. So they did not starve. They landed in New Jersey. They ended up in 1802 in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, for a number of reasons. The Wilmington area had a uh, burgeoning French community, so he could hire workers uh, here. Uh, they left because. Uh, basically of the French Revolution. Um, they were supporters of Louis XVI and uh, some of the other uh, royals, and as such were hounded by the royals' enemies. So they decided to come over to the United States to see if they could make their fortune here. And they came over with uh, seven business ideas, uh, import, export, uh, mail service to France, and so forth, uh, but all of these ideas uh, failed to come to fruition. Um, but it so happens that E.I. had trained at the Esson uh, powder mills south of Paris with Antoine Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry. And so he knew how to make gunpowder. So he searched the East Coast, New York to Washington and beyond, and found this little community in Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, decided to build his very, very first DuPont factory here in Wilmington on the Brandywine Creek. That's the reference in the title. Um, the other reference in the title, by the way, Tyler, uh, is Across the Creek. Uh, this was the euphemism that the men used for when one of their compatriots was killed in an explosion. They said he went across the creek uh, because, of course, the explosion would um, shoot the uh, uh, bodies across uh, the Brandywine Creek where the uh, roll mills that they used to make the powder uh, were situated. It's, it's, I guess, to be expected when we're talking about a gunpowder mill, you are talking about building an explosive uh, substance. But 
when it comes to the actual uh, safety measures and the actual day to day of uh, creating the gunpowder, it seems like this was kind of a common occurrence. And what sorts of things uh, were they doing to, first of all, to try to stop them? And, and also, what sorts of things would end up kicking off one of these big explosions? Well, let's start with, with the latter, the, the kicking off. Um, unfortunately, in most of the cases, uh, all of the witnesses were victims of the accident. So they really didn't, they hardly ever knew what the cause was. But some of the potential causes were uh, the powder was too dry, uh, the air was too dry, there was lightning. Uh, it was said sometimes that uh, nuts or bolts would fall out of the machinery and into the mix. And when the cast iron wheels, which are normally not um, conducive to sparking, uh, they they might cause a spark uh, on a on a metal nut or a metal bolt, uh, and this could set the powder off. Um, they even believed that uh, some of the causes were um, because the men would go home for a break, say at lunchtime in the winter, and they would come back with uh, an ember in the cuff of their pants or their shirts or their coats, and these embers were live fire and that they might cause an explosion. So there were a number of potential causes, but they never really were able to pin it down. In terms of what they did to avoid explosions, uh, they had guards at the gates. The guards checked everyone for metal or for matches. You couldn't take your smoking materials into the grounds, so the men would find in the exterior um, uh, stone fences, they would find places to, nooks and crannies to hide their smoking materials that they could uh, take part in uh, when they were on a break. So they weren't allowed these these items. They weren't allowed uh, belt buckles, for example, made out of metal. Uh, even their shoes had uh, wooden pegs instead of metal pegs. So they, they weren't permitted to bring any metal into the uh, powder mills. Uh, unlike the English, who developed a kind of a flood system, if you will, with uh, 30, 30 or 40 gallon tureens of water over their uh, mills that would tip um, when there was an explosion and, and, and put the fire out or uh, would not permit the explosion to communicate to another powder mill, um, the DuPonts never adopted that, uh, that particular uh, technique. They did stress safety. Um, they didn't like the men drinking uh, before coming to work or on the job. Uh, eventually, they prohibited the sale of alcohol uh, in the stores around the grounds, and they used a um, substitution called Switchel. And Switchel was actually... Um, a drink that was non-alcoholic, but it kind of had the burn, if you will, uh, uh, that alcohol provided. So they uh, could drink any of, any of that that they wanted. Um, in other uh, cases, uh, the whole safety first uh, movement pretty much started with the DuPonts and the powder works uh, for obvious reasons, um, but it just wasn't enough. Um, in the 120 years of powder making on the Brandywine. Uh, they lost 235 men, women, and one child to about 290 explosions. Now, that number was actually less than the number in mining and other manufacturing or road building or canal building. It was actually about two fatalities per year on average, but it was less, and in some cases, much less than those other uh, job, uh, the other jobs might have. Was this something that was in keeping with other gunpowder mills as well? Were, were, were they pretty good compared to others, or were they uh, deficient? Um, I'm not sure about other powder mills, except for one in England uh, that had a very, very good record. Uh, the Waltham Abbey uh, gunpowder plant in England um, 
had a very good uh, safety rating. Um, they were around for, I don't know, 250 years or something like that. And uh, they had, I think, fewer than 100 deaths. Um, the Ballincollig Mills in Cork, Ireland, uh, where E.I. DuPont recruited some of his workers, also had a pretty good record. So I think the, the British Isles in general had uh, a better record than gunpowder plants here in America. I don't know, though, how DuPont compared with other, du- uh, with other uh, powder plants here in the U.S., so now you you talked about recruiting, and that's actually something that I, I wanted to get into because the the next question is, it seems like a pretty rough place to be working, and uh, from what you wrote, it doesn't seem like they necessarily got paid tons of money. What kind of uh, recruitment base are we talking about when we talk about the people who were actually working there? It sounds like there were a lot of Irish. Uh, there were a great number of Irish. They were preceded by French. Uh, the city of Wilmington had a small enclave of Frenchmen who had fled the 1791 uh, Dominican Republic slave revolt, uh, and they landed here in Wilmington. And uh, so he was able to uh, choose from that cadre of people. Uh, and of course, when he first came, he did not know English, so it was easy for him to discuss uh, his needs and uh, for them to discuss their needs in terms of making gunpowder uh, because they spoke a common language. However, um, early on, he realized that uh, two things. The French wanted too much money, and they tried to tell him how to make gunpowder. Uh, for example, the um, the buildings, the roll mills where the actual ingredients were combined um, were three-sided buildings. And so the French who were first hired would, of course, help him build these buildings along with masons and, and others. And they sort of snickered behind his back in terms of, you know, what the heck is he building a three-sided building for? It's going to be cold in winter, you know, this kind of thing. Well, clearly, uh, he was building a three-sided building so that the power of any accidental explosion would go out the open side and not uh, go up the hill behind the mills where the people were uh, living and where the families were. So he eventually decided to hire the Irish. Uh, For the most part, they pretty much were, they did what they were told. Um, they knew nothing about powder making. Uh, some of them, uh, most of the of the common laborers, didn't know much about powder making, and so he could train them in his methods and in safety and in quality production and, and so forth. So uh, eventually, he went over to Ireland and uh, recruited Irish. In the later 19th century, many Italians had come to Wilmington. And so you can see in the death rolls where the Italians started dying in the powder mills later in the 19th century. So it sounds like he's primarily uh, relying on immigrant labor and even some immigrant labor that that from recruiting in Ireland, he's bringing over himself. That's correct. Yeah. He recruited men, um, some with experience, some not. Now. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the term chain migration, but actually it's a it's a term that's in the news these days. But chain migration is where a person comes over, usually a young man, earns a couple years worth of salary, saves it up in the company accounts, earns interest on it, by the way, and then uses that money to purchase tickets so that his family could come over. He might, if he was single, he might have left cousins, even fathers and mothers. He would bring them over with his brothers and his sisters, uh, his cousins. And even if they were not going to work in the DuPont Powder Works, uh, DuPont still paid for them to come over and then 
debited the gentleman's account to pay off the, the bill for the transport. So do you end up seeing a lot of families when you're looking at the roles of people who are working and I guess, unfortunately, people who are dying in uh, these powder mill explosions? Yes. Uh, the families are a very important part of the book um, because, of course, when the breadwinner uh, passed away due to an explosion, uh, it was the wives, the widows, uh, and the uh, children who carried on the name. And uh, this happened quite often. Um, cousins, uncles, aunts, uh, mothers and fathers, grandmothers uh, could be brought over um, by the DuPonts. Um, and then, you know, they, they, would, they would pay the ticket cost, even if you had a dozen people, which might cost two or $225 or something like that. And then um, the man would pay them back at 50 cents a month or a dollar or two a month or something like that until the debt was paid. And so this chain migration brought over many, many other Irish and eventually Italian families. So the families were, were very important. Now, many of the men were signal, single, um, but about a little more than half, I think, were married. And then, of course, many of them married when they arrived here. Now, when uh, when you're talking about, I mean, $225, is is it right? When I, I saw that you wrote that they actually made something like four cents an hour when you par- or parted things out at the start. I mean, that that's <laughs> that's a lot of money for somebody who's making that little. <laughs> well, uh, of course, this was uh, early 19th century, and and uh, obviously those uh, those rates in today's dollars would be significantly higher. But yes, um, they worked a 66 hour week in the good weather months and a 54 hour week in the winter months. Uh, they would work uh, 11 hours a day every day but Sunday. Uh, If they didn't work, they didn't get paid. Uh, If they got injured, they did have a doctor available. And if they got injured on the job, the doctor's bill was paid by the DuPonts, um, but they didn't get their paychecks. Um, And so at about $10 a month in, let's say, 1802, uh, when the company first started uh, producing powder, um, it, it turns out to be about a nickel an hour. Wow. That's a, I mean, obviously, as you said, it, it, it money costs different then. It was a different uh, time and inflation has made that a lot lower, but it's still just, it right. does not seem like all that much. No, it, uh, it, it's hard to believe. Were the DuPonts thought of as good to work with? Were they uh, people who uh, engendered some amount of loyalty from their employees? Or was there resentment about the conditions, about the pay, about anything surrounding them? Well, while there were others in the area who made more, many of the others made less. So working in the powder was considered a good job. Um, The DuPonts also participated in what's called the paternalistic style of management as opposed to the authoritarian style of management. The paternalistic, for example, I mentioned earlier, once they reached $100 in their account, in the account books of DuPont, which were kept very, very meticulously and truth and truthfully, um, they earned six percent interest, which was about one percent difference um, higher than you could get for U.S. government bonds at that time. Uh, so they earned six percent interest. Um, again, as I mentioned, if they were injured on the job, they had a doctor available. It happened to be the Dupont family's doctor. Um, and if you were injured on the job, your, your doctor bill was paid. Um, but the doctor was always available to the workers. 
Um, they had a school on the property called the Brandywine Manufacturer Sunday School, and a single man was debited 25 cents a year, and a married family was debited 50 cents a year to pay for the teaching staff and the materials in the school. And so here again, um, that's about a day's pay, maybe day and a half pay, uh, which paid for your children's schooling for the entire year. Uh, one man, for example, in the 1820s, 1830s, paid 12 and a half cents uh, for each child in um, one year for their schooling. Um, so there were there were lots of benefits, if you will, to living in a paternalistic society. Now, of course, on the other side, um, you know, if you had a grievance, it was difficult to uh, get that grievance taken care of. Um, it, it was easier than most places because you could go to one of the DuPonts who generally um, would not make their workers do anything that they themselves would not do. And uh, so you could get that grievance uh, resolved by just walking across the street and, and talking to one of the DuPonts. And you also mentioned at one point that, uh, unfortunately, if there was a worker who died on the job, that it sounds like his family and uh, specifically his widow would be taken care of to a certain extent. That's correct. Um, the widows received a $100 per year annuity um, for as long as she lived, as long as she met two conditions. She had to remain a widow. She didn't remarry. And she had to remain on the DuPont grounds where she lived in a house free for the rest of her life. Uh, one of the women, um, after her husband's death, uh, stayed around for 47 years. So she got $4,700, again, consider inflation, and that's a fairly good amount of money, around 60000 I think, um, over those whatever years. And um, in addition, the male children, the young men, as soon as they were of age, uh, could work in the factory. Uh, children did not work in the factory in this particular factory because of the danger. Uh, women also did not work in the factory handling materials. Uh, they could do other jobs. And you mentioned families before. The families could supplement the treasury by uh, peeling willow trees. Willow tree um, limbs were considered the best uh, material for charcoal, which is one of the three ingredients of gunpowder, the other two being uh, saltpeter or potassium nitrate and sulfur. Both of those came from overseas. Uh, the black willow trees grew abundantly in the mid-Atlantic area, and so they could uh, use them up on their property and then go to farmers in the area and, and get them. But the wives and the children, even uh, at four, five, six years old, uh, could easily peel the willow uh, in order to make the, the charcoal or the willow limbs ready to um, be made into charcoal. So you were, and this is something that I'd like to get into because uh, we are talking ultimately, as much as it sounds like the DuPonts, again, you know, relative to the standards of, standards of the time, were a relatively decent place to work for. You're talking about something that is uh, really, really dangerous, and and I'd like to get into more about the black powder. Uh, first of all, gunpowder. Uh, I guess most people would would understand it is uh, being used in guns. What what other uses uh, would it have had? What kind of people were they selling to? Um, I think they got a a grant or uh, some kind of uh, contract with the U.S. government for a while. Yes, at one point, uh, Thomas Jefferson said that, uh, wrote a note to E.I. DuPont and said, uh, we're only going to buy powder from you. Uh, turns out he didn't keep the promise, but uh, they were a major purchaser. The U.S. Army, U.S. Navy were uh, major purchasers of uh, powder. Uh, 80% of the powder made, and, and here again, let me sort of delineate. We use the term black powder powder 
to cover 100% of what they made. Gunpowder was about 20% of what they made, and blasting powder was about 80% of what they made. And blasting powder could be used by an Illinois farmer uh, removing tree stumps from a forest to make a nice, smooth uh, farm field. Um, West Virginia coal miners could use it to uh, expose a coal seam in a, a West Virginia mine. Uh, Nevada or California gold diggers could uh, use black powder to uh, expose a gold seam. Uh, road builders could use it. Canal builders could use it. Uh, these kinds of things were the places where blasting powder could be used. So this is a really important, especially for a nation that throughout the 19th century was doing a lot of that building, a lot of railroad building, a lot of mining. This is a very important substance, and it starts making sense as to why DuPont was able to grow into such a large company. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, black powder was, you know, the very first thing they made. And... Uh, uh, towards mid-century, mid-19th century, they were up to about a million pounds a year. Uh, they had um, several sets of mills, if you will, um, that all combine to make what is currently called the Hagley Museum, um, which is on the grounds of the original DuPont factories. And there were three or four sort of subsections, if you will. Um, but uh, yes, the the demand for good quality powder at a reasonable price uh, was very high back then. And you mentioned before that uh, you have charcoal, you have saltpeter, which is at potassium nitrate, and sulfur. The mill was on a river, uh, the, the, the Brandywine, and it's like many mills, it was water powered. How exactly, uh, when you have these ingredients coming in, how exactly uh, did everything happen such that coming out, you have your nice barrel or whatever they came out in of black powder? Well, the three ingredients um, were in a specific composition. 75% uh, was the potassium nitrate. Uh, its chemical signature is KNO3, which means it has uh, three molecules or three atoms of oxygen uh, for every one of whatever. And so um, this was 75% of the mix. 12.5% of the mix was the sulfur and 12.5% was the uh, charcoal. Uh, the sulfur, let's see, the charcoal provided the fuel and uh, the sulfur provided kind of the ignition, if you will. Um, so when they first got the sulfur from Sicily and the potassium nitrate from the Bengal region of India, these were their first sources, uh, they would either have it refined, have those two ingredients refined, or would refine them themselves. Uh, in the case of um, sulfur, uh, and I'm, I'll probably get these mixed up, but in one case, uh, I think it's sulfur, you, you boil it, you put it in, in water, you boil it, um, the gases rise, and as the gases fall in a, in a separate chimney, they, um, are, they are refined. Uh, all of the, the um, impurities are uh, taken out. Uh, same thing for the uh, potassium nitrate. Uh, the the specific way of refining, I, I can't recall right now, but it's kind of the same thing. It's heated and uh, the impurities are drawn out so that you have 100% pure uh, sulfur or potassium nitrate. Um, those three ingredients they had about three and a half miles of uh, a narrow gauge railroad track. Uh, most of the, the carts in the early days were drawn by horses. Um, 
and they would take the ingredients and uh, refine them. Then they would uh, mix them in the quantities that I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, three quarters potassium nitrate, one eighth sulfur, one eighth charcoal. They would put them in, in what amounts to a large wooden bowl, which is about 12 to 15 feet across. And uh, the machinery consisted of two eight ton cast iron wheels that when you open the sluice gate to let the water uh, flow downhill into a water wheel or a water turbine in the later years, um, would turn and the eight ton wheels would crush the ingredients together, just like when you make a cake, you put flour and salt and soda and powdered soda powder or whatever. I haven't made a cake for a long time. Uh, <laughs> And you put these ingredients together, they're not a chemical mix, but they are a physical mix. Um, and then you take that product carefully because it's now explosive where it hadn't been before. And you take that product on the railroad track to the next uh, place, uh, keeping in mind that during the production, during the mixing uh, or the, um, the mixing process, um, the men sometimes would pause the wheels and put two or three quarts of water in just so that you didn't have a, an accidental explosion. So you had a little water in there. So you would go to the press house and you would hydraulically press out the water. Uh, the pressing also had another advantage in that the more powder is compressed, the more powerful it is. So you would press the, the water out, make it more powerful. Uh, you would then go to the next step, which was the graining. Another word for graining is sizing, where you had different sizes of grains. We talked earlier about blasting powder, which had larger grains, and uh, gunpowder, which had smaller grains. Um, and then once that was done, once you had it sized, you uh, put it in barrels and, and surrounded it with graphite, the same material that we have in our pencils today. And the graphite would make it easier to pour and also would help uh, maintain the safety um, because it kept water out. Um, uh, not safety, but uh, just the viability of the, of the powder because, you know, the old saying, keep your powder dry. So it was best not to have any water in it. Uh, they then packed it in 25-pound kegs, sometimes in larger kegs made of wood, eventually of metal. And uh, those would then be um, kept in a magazine and then distributed all over the world. So it sounds like it, it, there are a lot of steps in that process uh, in which you are handling gunpowder, which is a very explosive and potentially dangerous substance. Was there any part of the process in particular that, that tended to be the most dangerous? Well, in the early days, they used a, a, a thing that, that EI had learned in France called a pounding or a stamping mill. Um, if you think of a mo modern, uh, modern day pestle and mortar, um, where you have the material sitting down below and above it, you have, let's say, six by six um, logs coming down on it and, and stamping it and, and crushing it that way with a stamping motion. Um, that was very dangerous. And in fact, many of the early explosions were due to the fact that they were using stamping mills. Uh, in the 1820s, E.I., who was a Frenchman and who didn't particularly like the English, uh, finally adopted an English method of a roll mill, which is just the, what I said earlier, the eight-ton wheels that just uh, roll and crush uh, the ingredients. Now, these were much more efficient. It, you could run two mills with one guy, whereas in a pounding mill, it sometimes took eight or nine guys uh, to run just that one mill. So the roll mill was, was more efficient, and uh, you could make much more uh, and much more efficiently, um, your powder. Whenever this explosion did happen, what happened? What was the, what were the immediate after effects? I know we talked about the fact that it's not 
always entirely clear what started it because obviously the uh, people closest to the explosion are not going to be around. But what what was immediately happening uh, after the explosion and what was the response like? Well, of course, during the explosion, uh, depending on the amount of powder, uh, and it wasn't always tons and tons, it was sometimes ounces or pounds, um, but it did eventually become tons and tons, uh, or occasionally, I guess I should say. Um, Basically, um, the buildings, which were made out of what's called Wilmington Blue Rock, which happens to be the name of our minor league baseball team for the Kansas City Royals. Uh, they took their name from, from the Blue Rock. Um, the, the, the Blue Rock, uh, its scientific name is NICE, G-N-E-I-S-S, and it's, it is, and it's very impervious to explosion, but not completely. Um, we have pictures in the, uh, in the library, in the Hagley Library, um, that show the aftermath of an explosion where um, the stones, which are set with mortar, uh, the mortar being the weakest point, um, and the walls might move two or three inches, or some of the stones might move two or three inches, and you can see the cracks between them. Um, so, um, of course, there's a concussive force from an explosion. Uh, if there were trees nearby, uh, they were mostly de-leaved. Uh, the leaves were blasted off. Uh, sometimes the trees would start on fire. Um, if there were other buildings and they tried to keep the buildings, what they call the danger buildings separate. In other words, not quite so close, but it didn't always work. Uh, and there were some occasions where there were seven or eight roll mills that went up in the same series of explosions. Um, but afterwards, um, of course, it was the job of the survivors, of the men who were not near the mill, to, um, how can I say this, uh, pick up the pieces. Uh, one of the favorite uh, newspaper sayings about uh, being, being, uh, killing, being killed in an explosion was, he was blown to atoms, uh, meaning you just couldn't find any parts of him left. Uh, and without putting too fine a point on it, uh, the job of the survivors was to take buckets and baskets um, across the creek, uh, because that's the euphemism they used for an explosion. And um, you picked up the flesh and bones of uh, your uh, former compatriots. Um, of course, in the series type explosions, when the first one went off, um, the wives and families would immediately run down to the factory gate and wonder whose mill was it. Uh, and the guard at the gate didn't always know, um, but everyone assumed it was their husband or their son or their nephew's mill that had gone up and were quite distraught until, of course, they found out differently or they found out that it was, in fact, their person. Um, and once the um, bodies were found, whatever parts were available, uh, were put into coffins, and, and the entire community usually had a um, community funeral. Uh, if several men were killed at the same time, um, of course, they would, they would fill the church. Uh, the DuPonts would also, uh, would always provide um, flower uh, arrangements, flower blankets, if you will, uh, for, the, uh, for the funerals, and uh, actually care, cared very deeply about their men. Um, again, as I said earlier, the DuPonts would not ask their men to do anything that they wouldn't do, and so um, they became fairly good friends with most of their workers and uh, grieved along with the families when, when the uh, people died. This, it sounds, I mean, just like a, a, a horribly traumatic experience, uh, not just for, obviously, uh, the, the family members who would be rushing down, you, you wouldn't necessarily know, but uh, for, for the men themselves, did they view this as something just 
to be expected? Were they, uh, did they end up kind of desensitized to this concept after a while? I, I can't imagine having to go over and, and as you say, euphemistically pick up the pieces. Yeah. Um, they were somewhat fatalistic. Um, they knew the dangers. Um, they tried their best in most cases to avoid danger. Um, but it was such a split second thing that you couldn't always do that. Um, but yeah, they, they knew the danger and, uh, were somewhat fatalistic about it. It's just, it seems remarkable to, to think about. And it, it sounds like there weren't necessarily emergency teams at the time. You, you wouldn't be calling the local de- fire department or would you, uh, would you, would you have anybody outside of the uh, factory workers themselves uh, and their families who would be able to provide any kind of relief? Well, typically the DuPonts were very secretive about their uh, manufacturing and about their process. So um, you didn't let just anyone in um, uh, to help. Um, now, doctors in the area would generally uh, get admittance and get past the cordons and uh, be able to um, assist. Um, uh, in later years, of course, there were fire departments and they probably were, were called. Ambulances were called. Um, in some cases, um, the survivors would carry the men back to their homes um, in too many cases so their families could say goodbye. Um, but of course, the local hospitals also um, were points where they could take them in. Um, some of the men uh, tragically uh, died in agony uh, four, five, six days after uh, being burned head to toe in in a gunpowder explosion. Uh, it was not it was not easy, and I don't pretend in writing a book about the men who died. Um, that it was. Uh, it was very traumatic. Um, I've often been asked as a tour guide at Hagley Museum um, if the men uh, suffered from uh, any illnesses or psychological difficulties, and I haven't read anything uh, in my research about that. Um, I'm often asked uh, with, with all this powder around uh, did they suffer lung disease? And I have seen no evidence that they did. Um, also, if they were close to, but not so close as to be killed in an explosion, but they were close enough to hear it, did they have hearing loss? And I have read nothing about that. Uh, doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, it just hasn't been recorded. So regardless, though, it was something that uh, wasn't just uh, wasn't just an explosion and it was over. You had people, I guess, maybe not far enough away to uh, be caught up in the initial explosion. But as you say, uh, burns and and, and other potential, uh, not even deadly injuries, but, uh, you know, lifelong issues, I I assume. I mean, would you would you have limbs uh, and, and, and various, you know, people who were unable to work after uh, these explosions? Yes. Um, I don't know uh, how many um, limbs were lost with people who survived, but I I do know one story in the late 1800s about a a man who um, had worked in the mills for several years and was severely injured. They, in fact, reported in the newspapers that the body of this man had been removed when in fact he survived for another 25 years. Um, but he was blinded, um, with, um, shards of wood from the buildings, um, being driven into his skull. Um, he was blinded for the remainder of his life, but insisted on, uh, doing the normal jobs around the house that he could do. Um, he did get something of a pension, um, not a lot. Um, but yes, there, they were, there were, uh, some injuries, um, that men carried with them for the rest of their lives. It, it's just an incredible concept, uh, to, to be working in such a dangerous environment. Um, and, 
it seems like the 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 men who worked there were uh, had some really incredible stories to them and and this is one thing that your book really dives into that uh, I think is really important it, it really does humanize uh, the people who are behind there rather than uh, talking about statistics oh x number of people at x uh, point can you tell us maybe what one or two of your your favorite um, stories um, or particularly interesting people or maybe even particularly, uh, uh, I guess, representative people uh, that would have come through uh, and uh, would have been involved with the uh, with the gunpowder mills there? Sure. Um, let's talk about Samuel Buchanan. Uh, Sam Buchanan. Uh, died in the early 1900s, and uh, they were preparing uh, for his funeral. Uh, And back then, funerals generally started in the homes of the deceased and then proceeded to the burial ground. But um, Samuel Buchanan, uh, someone found his hand um, a quarter mile away uh, a couple of days after the explosion. In fact, They were gathering at his house uh, to begin the funeral. Uh, He was a member of a fraternal group that was uh, arriving. And so the fellow worker who found his hand uh, gave it to the undertaker. And the undertaker found a uh, surreptitious opportunity to uh, put the hand in the casket. And the family was said to be very thankful that... uh, that this had occurred. Uh, another man. Wow. What? Go ahead. Wow, I was just that's that's uh, just a remarkable story, and um, the fact that it was a quarter mile away definitely shows the, uh, the the significance of that explosion. Was he the only person who was who was killed in that particular incident? Uh, I believe he was. Yes. Um, wow. There, there were others. The eighteen eighteen explosion. Um, killed 34 men, uh, and they actually stopped uh, production for a few months because uh, they just didn't have the workers. Um, But another interesting story is a gentleman by the name of Michael Burrell. Uh, He was born in um, Canada uh, and came here to work and actually had worked. He started uh, shortly after that 1818 explosion. And uh, 25 years later, um, he was killed with a couple of other men in an explosion in the 1840s. And um, he had uh, uh, several children. Um, one of his sons, uh, George, um, was with a unit at the uh, siege of St. Petersburg. Uh, He was hit in the left lung by a Confederate sniper and uh, died a few days later uh, of his injuries. Uh, Other men had sons um, in the uh, military during the Civil War. Uh, One man had a son who became a um, he became a, a drummer boy and his brother actually worked for the Confederates in one of their mills in Tennessee. And eventually that mill in Tennessee was bought by the DuPonts seven or eight years after the Civil War. Um, One final story I think is kind of interesting is uh, a kid by the name of um, Alan Thaxter. Now, Alan Thaxter was an adoptee from Maine, Portland, Maine, and uh, his father was uh, very well off. He was a leader in the uh, Portland, Maine community and had actually won the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. But Alan, uh, who actually had a college degree and was a broker, um, a financial broker, somehow ended up being the foreman when an explosion occurred on November 30th, 1915. The interesting thing about Allen is that he, first of all, had a degree. Uh, he had uh, you know, been in, in several sort of high uh, 
status jobs. And so the question is, why was he working in the powder? And we just don't know the answer to that question. Hmm. So it sounds like there, there were, to a certain extent, uh, people from all walks of life who were working there. Obviously, as we, we talked about, there were a lot of immigrants um, and it wasn't a glamorous or highly paid job. But uh, but you did have people from uh, from various backgrounds uh, coming in as well. Right. And and there were a couple of other men uh, who came from um, uh, high class families, if you will, um, uh, fathers who were landowners, uh, bankers. Um, Alan's father was a grain merchant up in Maine. And uh, yeah, there were several like that who who, for whatever reason, uh, decided to work in the powder and uh, paid with their lives for the privilege. Now, uh, time, you know, and, 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 and technology goes on and, and we have various explosives now that are not uh, anywhere near black powder. Black powder is seen as kind of a primitive thing, I think generally used in uh, kind of recreational and uh, and uh, various you know reenactments that sort of thing nowadays um, what is it that brought the end of uh, the gunpowder mills uh, in the uh, I- I- the DuPont gunpowder mills and obviously caused the, the DuPont family to branch out into various other things well the primary cause was just the drop in demand for black powder um, of course, Alfred Nobel had invented dynamite um, back in the late 1800s. Um, uh, black powder simply just wasn't needed anymore. The factory closed in October of 1921. Uh, the war, the First World War, had ended um, three years before. Um, so the military didn't need as much powder. Um, newer explosives were on the market. And frankly, the method of using uh, water to run those eight-ton wheels to make uh, powder was really antiquated. I mean, it was 1830s, 1820s technology and earlier. And the DuPonts found that they could make black powder elsewhere in the country uh, much more efficiently using more modern, for 1920, techniques. And so um, uh, the factory um, closed. Now, they made powder until the 70s, the DuPonts did, Um, but they only made it there in uh, Wilmington to 1921. And I think it is important for people to realize as well that uh, they, uh, that, that DuPont, again, is still one of the largest, I, I'm not sure of the exact uh, rankings, but it is one of the largest companies out there, uh, chemical companies, and uh, it is still very much a force today. And it, it all started on this gunpowder mill uh, in Delaware uh, back in, uh, in the early 1800s. That's right. Well, it's it's an incredible story, and it's something that, again, I, I will uh, tell listeners that they can read about a lot more in Across the Creek, Black Powder Explosions on the Brandywine. Uh, the author, Richard D. Templeton, has been joining us uh, talking about this really interesting story and just really dangerous work. It, it Makes me glad that I do not have to work in a gunpowder mill. Uh, let me tell you, I'm, I'm sure you have the same uh, uh, the same feelings when, well, when actually, you're going giving tours. Sure, yeah. I, I mean, I am a tour guide, and so technically, I work in a gunpowder factory, but um, we don't make gunpowder anymore. <laughs> I'd imagine it's it's a little bit safer nowadays just than, a little than bit, it was before. Yes, just a little bit, much quieter. Now, uh, people can find this on Amazon, uh, can find it, you said, on, on bn.com in the ebook and in physical book form. And you also have a website that you can point people to. Right. And the website is www.bluerockpublishing, all one word, dot com, bluerockpublishing.com. 
And, BlueRockPublishing.com. Right. And uh, if they order the book through the website, I'll be happy to sign the book for them. That's wonderful. And we will have a link to that uh, alongside uh, this, uh, the post on Reddit. If you go to uh, reddit.com slash r slash ask historians, you will be able to uh, find the post that links to this podcast episode. We'll have a link up there as well to that at bluerockpublishing.com. It's a story that, to be honest, as I said, just makes me glad that I am not a gunpowder manufacturer, definitely not one for people with uh, without solid stomachs, but uh, really interesting history. And Richard D. Templeton, the author of Across the Creek, thank you so much for joining me. Tyler, it was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm Tyler Alderson. And we'll see you in two weeks. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history. (laughs) 